Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Claire Noble. I'm the program manager with the Vail Symposium. On behalf of Chris Sable, our executive director, Dale Mosier, our board chairman, and the entire Vail Symposium board, I'd like to welcome you to this evening's program. We're now in our 49th year of providing educational, thought-provoking, and affordable programming to the Vail community. Vail, Colorado is our home and it is North America's, one of North America's premier outdoor recreation destinations. A couple of shout outs. I'd like to welcome the Hanolds this evening. I know that they're big baseball fans and they're missing their sport. I also want to welcome Meredith Ringler's sister, Randy, who's spent her career working in baseball, including 15 years as the marketing director for the New York Mets. And I'd also like to thank Joe Kania of Fully Committed Films for our tech support this evening. Tonight's topic is baseball and the American dream with Professor Tom Zeiler and our moderator, Greg Dobbs. A couple of program notes before we get started. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A option. And that's how you're going to ask questions and make comments tonight to the speaker. And I will be monitoring that and passing on, along those questions and comments. So let's give that a try right now. And I got a great suggestion yesterday from Lauren Hershey of a question to ask. And that is, did you grow up in a baseball town? So did you grow up in Chicago, Boston, New York? And if so, what was your team? And are they still your team? And if not, uh, have you adopted a team? I'm an immigrant to Colorado, so I'm trying to assimilate. So I'm gonna say the Colorado Rockies are my team. Also, while everyone's doing that, some other program notes. Tonight's program is being videotaped. It's running from six until seven o'clock. And then we will be posting it to our website as well as to Facebook. So just give us a day or so to get that posted. Also know that your video and audio are muted. So you can see us, but we cannot see you. So I want to thank our sponsors for tonight's program, the Town of Vail, Vail Resorts Epic Promise, the Vail Daily, and the Antlers at Vail. I'd also like to thank our generous underwriters. Underwriting the Hot Topic series are Kathy and Neil Kimmel. And underlying, um, underwriting rather the summer series is Cindy Ingalls and Leela and Walt Misher. And the Vail Symposium is supported by a generous grant from the Frechette Family Foundation. I also want to put in a plug for our program coming up next week. Next week's program brings together two former governors to talk about how governors have really emerged on the national stage in the COVID-19 pandemic. And those two governors that will be joining us are former Ohio Governor John Kasich and former New Mexico Governor Bill Richardson. Tonight's moderator is Greg Dobbs. Greg spent nearly 50 years as a journalist and has, has reported for more than 80 countries, mostly as a foreign and a war correspondent for two networks, but principally ABC News. He's a multi Emmy award winner. He's also awarded the um, Distinguished Service Award from the Society of Professional Journalists. And in 2017, he was inducted into the Denver Press Club Hall of Fame. I'm going to hand things over to Greg Dobbs, our moderator. Thank you, Claire, and hello, everybody. And I will tell you that I grew up in the city of San Francisco, and I was a young, just a child, when the New York Giants came to town, and I became a huge Giants fan. But then I lived overseas and kind of forgot about baseball and moved to Colorado in 1986. But I went to opening day, the very first opening day at Mile High Stadium for the Colorado Rockies. And when EY, Eric Young, hit a home run, first batter for the Rockies in Colorado, he hit it into the left field stands about two rows ahead of me. I was a fanatic for the Rockies mm -hmm. and that hasn't ended. Mm -hmm. Opening day this year was in early April. It was in early April, which means tomorrow we'll have been in the baseball season for eight weeks, if 
there had been a season. But you don't have to be a fan to see that with the country still somewhat paralyzed by this pandemic. Baseball's season at a standstill is like a, a snapshot of society overall. But it's not just a snapshot. As you're going to hear in this hour, whether or not you know the difference between a, a strike and a stolen base, the great American pastime is a reflection of America itself. It's a reflection of its best qualities, sometimes of its lesser self. But baseball might be a metaphor for America, a metaphor for its history, for the progress that's been made in this country, and for the barriers we still face. Dr. Tom Zeiler is a fan of the game, but like me, he's not a baseball player, he's not a baseball writer. He is a professor of history at the University of Colorado in Boulder. He's director of CU's program in international affairs. He's the author of 14 books that focus mainly on U.S. diplomacy and trade and foreign relations, much of which he brings to bear on the game of baseball. So Tom, let me throw the first pitch here. You've probably heard a lot of puns. And ask, ask whether you would agree that it is proof positive that this game is embedded in American culture because of the way it is embedded in American English. And by way of example, that's my way of letting you hit it out of the park. Well, thank you, Greg, and thank you for that introduction. Um, and hello, everybody. I wish I was there live with you. I'm sure everybody does, um, but we'll make do here. Um, and Greg, um, that question does not come out of left field, uh, for sure. If you all sit there and even Google right now, um, the, n the number of baseball terms we use in everyday life. You don't have to be a fan. You don't even have to like baseball or, or sports themselves to realize um, the impact um, on the game, certainly in language, but certainly in other ways. And that's what I'm interested in uh, as a historian. Um, and I think Greg will uh, you know, uh, field your questions too. And I hope that we can talk about that. I, um, I teach a course. Uh, called an American uh, History Through Baseball at CU Boulder. Been doing that now for uh, 20 years. Uh, and um, uh, it is, I, I really start that course by saying this is not a course about baseball. It's a course about history and how baseball serves as a window to look uh, at that history. And as Greg just said, there have been wonderful, very positive uh, influences of baseball. Um, and very negative as well. We'll, we'll. we'll talk about both of those. I hope to talk about both of those um, tonight by talking about focusing on race, but also focusing on uh, women and gender uh, even more. Um, so I'll step up to the plate and um, try to begin here. I, I, I have to admit though that I uh, always start my first lecture uh, in that course uh, by telling students, and we have a lot of out-of-state students, uh, that if they are Yankees, Red Sox, or Dodgers fans, they start with a C in the class, unfortunately. And then uh, usually what's funny is the out-of-state kids go, you know, they get it. It's the Colorado kids that usually say, what? That's, that's not very nice. Um, uh, but that's my lack of sense of humor. Um, this game, this game uh, of baseball, of course, has a long uh, lineage, and it goes back into the um, uh, early 19th century. Uh, the origins, of course, is an origins myth about it. Uh, Cooperstown, New York, supposedly the first baseball game, which is an absolute uh, fallacy. Um, and that's, uh, that, that's a whole other issue about nationalism and why it did become the national pastime. Um, uh, but myths and national myths, especially in a country that had torn itself apart in the American Civil War, uh, were very important. Um, it's not just baseball, though, that is a reflection. Um, think about this, it's sports. Uh, and I know we could have people sitting there uh, uh, watching this who are not sports fans. You don't have to be a sports fan to, to listen here, though. Uh, like I said, this is about history, but sports also, uh, for, for good or ill, uh, generates an emotion, generates a gut level emotion. I would argue it, it, it is, it, ha it, it, it motivates people uh, or, or brings out uh, emotions just like food does um, and holidays, just like music does. I think you'd have to throw in sports, perhaps consumerism, perhaps shopping does too, uh, but sports certainly does. And that's why it is a multi 
billion dollar. I mean, we're talking multi-billion dollar industry. We know it's a, these are kids games. These are children's games. Uh, but um, they really draw, of course, uh, a lot of attention uh, and, and a lot of money. Um, it's the entertainment industry, too. And that said, also, baseball is really no longer the national pastime. We know American football is, and basketball probably second. Baseball um, is, is likely third along with, with hockey. Um, uh, though, of course, it was the premier sport really up until the 1960s or into the, into the early 70s. And it's still, of course, a major sport, uh, but it, it wasn't a television sport. And so it's changed you know, like that, too. Um, but it always has had a reflection. It always has reflected, excuse me, um, um, history. I got your first slide here. Hopefully you can see this. Uh, Babe Ruth, now a, young, a youngster here playing for the Red Sox in 1918. Uh, I cannot absolutely verify that that is him at the plate. I think it is, though. Got this off the internet. Some of you might have seen this. But he actually contracted the, the flu in 1918 um, and was treated uh, uh, at first with silver nitrate that almost killed him. Uh, you know, the doctors just made a big mistake. And, of course, Ruth survived. And within a year and a half or so, he was traded to the Yankees. Um, and, and the rest is history. Uh, but, of course... Um, this is something I'll incorporate into my course, too, um, uh, next time I do it, uh, because, of course, of COVID uh, today, too. Um, I want to talk about a dream, though. I want to talk about baseball sports as, as fulfilling. Uh, what, we, what we think of is an American dream of coming up from nowhere, of equality, of opportunity, of justice. Uh, you don't have to be liberal or conservative uh, or, or anywhere in between uh, to, to think like that. that, 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 that uh, but, but baseball really did have a meaning and has had a meaning um, for success and failure in America, but, it's, but as a sport has also really touched on uh, those opportunities. Um, we've had plenty of players, managers, figures who have come out of nowhere, um, uh, and 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 we and around the game, of course, uh, we look at it as a, uh, you know in, in sort of a dream world. Um, again, if you're a, a good friend who works for Major League Baseball, he said, you know, you get a an eight, nine, ten, or eleven year old uh, hooked on a team on a baseball team. That's our age group. Once you've got them, you've got them hooked for life, um, and you'll you know they'll always follow that team. Uh, I've become a Rockies fan, but I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, so I'm a Braves fan to. Uh, I want to always follow them. My, I can, I'm certainly a Broncos fan. Uh, I'm not a Falcons fan. I'm a Broncos fan, all the Colorado teams, but not for baseball. Um, you know, if, if the Braves and the Rockies played as they did in 1995, uh, I'll always lean toward the Braves. Sorry about that. Um, but about dreams, about, about this, this, this idea of dreams, this motif of dreams um, and equality and what it meant, what, how this reflected on America. Um, I don't need to tell you this, of course, but at the top left hand, uh, uh, or this whole, this whole montage here is Jackie Robinson there at your bottom left, um, talking to President Richard Nixon. Jackie Robinson, by the way, was uh, uh, Republican, like most African Americans were, uh, or many of them were, and that really shifted in the 60s. Uh, but of course, this was the party of Lincoln, uh, and the Democrats were the party of segregationist South, too. Um, Robinson was always a moderate, really, until the late 60s, uh, um, uh, and, and became more critical uh, of politics and what was going on in the country, and certainly of Richard Nixon, too. Uh, but he would vote for Richard Nixon against Kennedy in 1960. Uh, I like to say about Jackie Robinson, I've written about um, in your top left, that, uh, and, it's, and it's not meant facetiously. Uh, but, but I always ask who's, one, who's the greatest civil rights pioneer or civil rights figure in, in American history. Of course, it's Martin Luther King. Um, but here was a guy in Jackie Robinson that eight years before you even knew the name Martin Luther King in 1955 in the Montgomery bus boycott, um, integrated the national pastime in 1947. He actually did it in 1946 when he played for the Montreal Royals, the uh, uh, International League or minor league team for um, the Brooklyn Dodgers. So the game actually, uh, not, April 15th, 1947, which we celebrate, um, we've retired his number 42 in every stadium. 
Um, you'll see it posted there. That's the big day when he walked on that field here in the middle uh, pictured here, but um, he did it a year before. The irony there, of course, is we really officially integrated the game in Canada. I mean, it came from Canada and Montreal. If you go visit Montreal, you can see some uh, plaques and commemoration of Jackie Robinson because he and his wife lived there. Um, so he really was the pioneer. Uh, and it was important because baseball, you know, baseball was like the, the U.S. Army or the military. I mean, these, these were the uh, sports and, and the military were the two great uh, uh, areas of soci sociological experimentation. Um, if America was going to change, it was likely going to be th uh, through one of those mediums. And Robinson, uh, Robinson would integrate uh, the game a year before President Harry Truman announced that he would integrate the U.S. Army. And that itself would take another couple of years. It, it really didn't kick in until about 1950 the full integration of the, of the military. And we know the history of segregated troops in World War II, I mentioned World War I, uh, but Robinson preceded all of that. It shows you, it's, it's, it's baseball's greatest moment. It's, it's the New York Times front page moment, um, the integration of baseball. Uh, it's a tremendous moment for baseball, but um, it's also, um, uh, th there, there is a darker side there too, because it took a long time. Uh, there was a Negro Leagues that had been created in the 1920s and going back um, um, into the 19th century, where baseball might have been the pioneer in, in integration, baseball was also one of the institutions that pioneered segregation. In the late 1880s, it drew the color line and refused to allow blacks and whites to play together. That preceded the historic Plessy versus Ferguson Supreme Court uh, decision of 1896 by about eight years, that decision, eight or nine years, that of course set out the principle of separate but equal that was struck down by Brown v. Board. I know Greg um, has, has uh, come up on my screen here, but again, if you think of Robinson coming into this league and integrating in 1947, that is fully a seven years, over a half decade before the Supreme Court strikes down the Plessy versus Ferguson separate but equal ruling with the Brown v. Board ruling on desegregation. And Tom, I came up on your screen to ask, is there any evidence that beyond the game of baseball, his integration, Jackie Robinson's uh, integration into the game spilled over into any other aspect of American society? No, that's a great, it's a great question. Um, at, at the level just of fans and sports, by the way, uh, b basketball, it sort of integrated uh, uh, a year before or so, or was talking about it. Um, in, in, in the realm of, of fans going to the game, it turned out that white people started accepting black people at games, right? So you found that across the country. And in the few years before he came into the league, there were surveys done among the white populations. Uh, you know, what would you say to a black player? In the South, there was, a, there was some resistance, but in the Northeast and the, and, and the Midwest, most people said, I want my team to win. And so when he came into the league, it did spill over, as you say, into other uh, aspects, probably had a bearing of making it a bit easier for Truman to integrate the military, uh, because now you had had a, a black player not the best black player. Larry Doby would actually come into the American League a couple of months later and integrate the American League. John Robinson would do the National League. Um, uh, not the best player, but, but he had behaved himself and it was more acceptable uh, to do that. Um, Robinson, I picture here too, because uh, you know, there at your bottom you know, is, is Nixon or at the right hand is, is Malcolm X. And, and um, um, Robinson, his effect when he retired um, and in the half decade or so after retirement that he lived, he died uh, at 53 years old in 1972, uh, was as sort of a civil rights moderate uh, who became more active uh, the closer he got to death. He got, became very critical of baseball and the institution. 1972 at the World Series, he actually spoke. It was the last public appearance before he died uh, where he you know, gave a speech. You can YouTube it. Uh, talking about how happy he was there, but he looked forward to the day when there would be black managers um, uh, along the, the line too. And, and 
Um, so the spillover in sports sort of opened up things, uh, hard to gauge how much of society then uh, became more accepting. But certainly, this was right on the cusp of the, the modern day civil rights movement when this happened. Um, there were still battles uh, over this. I mean, the last, the last team to integrate, it took them 12 years, was the Boston Red Sox, which has always kind of spurred this debate over is Boston, or what we know as the seat of liberalism in America, is it the most racist town in the country? Um, because, uh, and did, did Boston take Larry Bird over Magic Johnson, the 1979 or 1980 basketball draft, the white guy? It's always done that. Oil Can Bull Boyd would be the first black pitcher for the Red Sox in 1986. Um, so, so whether there is a spillover in sports and how much impact that integration had on society is certainly a question. There have been critics of it who said no. Uh, and if you look at statistics, even today, there are fewer and fewer black players playing baseball. One other question about sports overall, because you can include football and you mentioned basketball and hockey and darts, whatever it is. Are there African-American figures in other major sports who were even nearly as influential in integrating the sport and integrating the league as Jackie Robinson was in baseball? Oof, you'd have to help me on that, or, or that could be some good responses. Um, uh, you know, there have been influential players on other issues. I, I think of Magic Johnson and, and AIDS, and HIV AIDS. Um, Joe um, Kaepernick of the 49ers in football. Sure, sure, sure. No, nothing this sizable, not, nothing was this much of a transformation. Because again, at that moment, baseball truly was the national pastime. I mean, if you look at the percentage in cities of recreation dollars spent on baseball, viewing it, playing it, it was tremendous. Um, it, it was amazing. And as Claire noted too, there are truly baseball towns. Denver probably isn't as big a base. It's a football town. It's a lot like, uh, you know, a, a lot of the South, but in the Midwest or, or the East, I mean, there, it's baseball um, or even on the West Coast uh, too. Um, uh, so again, there is a, if, if we want to put it in the general context of this lecture of, is this an opportunity? Was this a field of, um, for black players? Certainly for many, certainly for many. Uh, but, um, you know, there is also an alternative argument here, too. Um, surveys and statistics done, statistical analysis done from the 80s and 90s showed that you had to have a higher batting average um, or a better ERA as a pitcher to remain on a team if you were black. You could be more mediocre as a white player. Uh, too. And again, the, if you look at the power structure of these sports, of our major sports, I don't know what it is now, but of 91, 92 of our sports in football, basketball, and baseball, um, very few. I think uh, Jacksonville Jaguars is, uh, is wholly owned by a, an underrepresented or a minority owner. Um, uh, it's still very much a white power structure. Jackie Robinson would have battled that too. Um, uh, about that too. He would have been disappointed with that. On the other hand, there were there was great progress uh, made here too. And of course, you can always say, listen, we did have a black president uh, eventually too. So maybe it takes time. We're also, of course, uh, horrifyingly looking at what happened in Minneapolis the other day with police and the continued police violence of the shooting um, uh, in, in Georgia on the coast a couple of weeks ago. So race remains the big issue uh, and sports has always had uh, a role in that. Um, if we have time, I can go into the international side of that too because Latinos, Hispanics have come into the game, Latin, Latin American players have come into the game. But in the early 20th century, that was a problem too. Some of them, they tried to pass for black, for white players. They tried to get black players to come in as Hispanic, they were stopped. Uh, but also their notion of the hot-headed Latino um, was very frequent, very frequently heard um, in America there too. So there's race and race prejudice. We could do a whole segment in weeks on immigration, on immigrants, on, on Jewish Americans and the anti-Semitism um, they faced. Um, on the other hand, um, uh, you know, there, there was progress made on that front too. 
uh, among a lot of ethnic groups. So that's maybe perhaps, perhaps some uh, questions will come out of this. I, I wanted to move um, uh, to, to women and gender, and we can certainly come back to race too. Um, because again, I don't wanna make it sound like everything's a, a real bummer here. Uh, but I think if you look at American history, you got to be pretty serious of looking at both the, the, the bad with the good, too. Um, and hard for us to imagine that baseball would be anything but good and fun. Um, and it is. And that's why we all follow it. Uh, but underneath there, uh, again, there are issues of society because the, the people who go to the games, the people who play the games, are Americans or, 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 or citizens of the world. Uh, whoever they are. Um, and so all of these issues come up, uh, whether it's about money and finance, or when it's about race and gender, ethnicity, um, that's one too. Um, women at the game. Um, you know, there had always been women in the game, going back to the 19th century and women playing it. Uh, you can look at uh, uh, old baseball cards or old posters from Vassar College in 1866 out of women's team in 19th and early 20th century, Bloomer Girls teams in Chicago, Detroit. Uh, and of course, we know most famously, um, because of Madonna uh, and Gina Davis, uh, a league of their own and the, the, the Women's Professional League in World War II. Um, uh, we'll come back to that in a second. But by the 1890s, early 1900s, of course, parallel to women going to baseball games and and especially in the South, teams and stadiums hosting what were called ladies' days. Um, uh, they could get free entry uh, into games, especially because they wanted women at the game because there's so much gambling and drinking and carousing among men who got violent at times. They thought that women would bring in, a, would, would soften things up and, and make it more of a respectable game. Uh, not always the case too. Early 20th century, even going back a little farther, of course, as you know, there's a campaign also by suffragettes to get women the right to vote. Um, and they would get that um, after World War I uh, under an amendment, I think amendment of, in, in 1920, but uh, it would take a major campaign. And women campaigned for that right to vote at baseball games at the national pastime. Women in all walks of life then we're trying to show that not only they should they have the vote, but they were certainly capable of getting advanced degrees in college, PhDs, they finally be allowed in there, that they were, they're smart enough and capable enough. And that battle would continue to be waged through the military now. You know, women are finally allowed in combat, but still there's un uneasiness about that too. Um, but back in the early 20th century, their campaign was taken up by middle class women who were also among the leaders in what was called the Progressive Era, which was the first major era of reform uh, in the United States, trying to get a handle on all these immigrants coming in, all the, uh, the, the uh, unhealthiness in factories and cities and and you know the, the rapid growth of the country had to had to control all that, and it was led by both Republicans and Democrats, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, Woodrow Wilson at a national level, all the way at local levels too. Part of that progressive era, then of reform, was getting the campaign for the to getting the women the right to vote, and part of women showing they were capable was also um, being knowledgeable about sports. I'm going to do something very painful for all of you. <clears throat> it doesn't hurt me as much, but I'm going to sing you a verse of, of a song and, and see if you can follow along. You see the words here. Let me start here by, by, by singing this, and then I'll move to this next slide quickly. You get why I'm singing it. Katie Casey was baseball mad, had the fever and had it bad, just to root for the hometown crew, every sou or dollar. Katie Blue, on a Saturday, her young beau called to see if she'd like to go to see a show, but Miss Kate said, no, but I'll tell you what you can do. You can take me out to the ball game. I hope you're all singing there, Greg. I hope people are singing. Take me out to the crowd. Buy me some peanuts and Cracker Jack. I don't care if I never get back. So it's root, root, root for the home team of the Rockies. 
they don't win. It's a shame because it's one, two, three strikes. You're out at the old ball game. Now, I bet you didn't know. And there's the next verse. But I'll bet you I didn't know it until I started teaching this class. This is the second most sung song in America behind Happy Birthday. Really? Take me out to the ball game. And it is about a woman. You can look at verses on Google that too. There are plenty. Katie is a different name on some of them. But she knew the game. Um, and she would use her feminine wile sometimes or just her intelligence to tell the umpire uh, what he should do. Baseball had been sort of co-opted uh, by women. And certainly this most famous song that, of course, we all sing at the games, uh, became, and it became a staple of games, really has its roots um, in, in feminism. It was really uh, written in 1908 uh, by a guy whose wife, uh, Nora Norwith, um, Jack Norwith, uh, loved, let me go back to that, just, just loved um, uh, the game. Uh, Jack Norwith wrote it um, for Nora Bays, his wife, in 1908, in the midst of the Progressive Era. Um, um, I've got a question for you. There yep. was a time before the time of Jackie Robinson, certainly before blacks even had the Negro League, when many Americans would have said, there is no future for African Americans in baseball. Today, there are still plenty of people probably who say, there is no future for women in baseball. Would you tell them and I'm talking about playing on the field, would you tell them that they're right or wrong? That's a great question. We're gonna, I was going to get to that um, uh, um, you know, very soon. Um, is there opportunities? I ask this in my class where I'm teaching a class. If I teach this class of 400 students, I got the, the men's football team, men's basketball team, women's volleyball, women's basketball. Um, and when I've said that, yeah, one day you'll have a second base woman for the Rockies. It's the women who say, uh, you got to be crazy. We can't even compete. But what we can compete in is intelligence. Can we manage? Um, can we, you know, and especially a sport where women have played softball and have not, or basketball, uh, why aren't there more women now in management positions or in recruiting positions? We'll get to that in, in a slide in, in, in a sec here too. Because it's a great question because here in, here's the parallel here too. Um, we believe that African Americans couldn't play this game as skillfully as white Americans. That was of course uh, a myth destroyed by the Negro League certainly. Um, and that whites would rebel if blacks played with them. Well that tr uh, turned out not to be true too. We also had women in World War II, uh, Rosie the Riveters and others. Um, um, in, in, the, in the factories, uh, showing that they could certainly pitch in for the war effort. And here, of course, is the Colorado Silver Bullets, the last women's professional team in the 1990s here in Colorado, uh, with Phil Negro, uh, an ex Atlanta Brave, as the manager. Women, it turned out, the Silver Bullets couldn't stay on the field, really, with um, a pro team of men. Even semi pro they started playing more semi pros, and they had to be a. They were older guys too, and then they could compete. But that's not the point. The point is, the point is, are they already here, women? And why aren't they allowed? Well, why don't we accept women fully into sports? Sure. I mean, you're, I'm showing you a, a, a number of pictures here. Let me take this one in the bottom left. Um, uh, Jingira, who in the 80s tried to become an umpire and was basically chased out of the game. Why aren't there more umpires and referees? Football now, as you can see here, has some. Head referees. Why in the, in the booth um, um, aren't there more announcers? Um, for example, Jessica Mendoza, uh, pictured, I'm, I'm blocked here, so I can't fully see this, but Jessica Mendoza is probably up there uh, at your right, um, was the first female television analyst for a major league, in a major league uh, baseball playoff game. And the first woman in any major North American sport to announce during a winner go home game, the Astros against the Yankees in a wild card game. She was the first to do that in October, 2015. If we look at this in one way, we say, wow, okay, there's progress and it takes time. But 2015, folks, 
feminists, activists, others will say, five years ago, really? Well, we don't like women's voices. We don't like to hear them announcing like that, or they might not know that. And, you know, even Jessica Mendoza would on Mother's Day be given flowers by her fellow announcers. And she kind of reacted one time saying, why are you giving me flowers? Just because Mother's Day? I mean, I'm not going to give you something on Father's Day. Um, was it stereotypes of women, right? Well, could you argue that the source of it might go back to pre-1960s before Title IX, when girls didn't even have an opportunity to play team sports in high school? And that while that's a long time ago now, that slowly they have come into sport, but in fact, have not been involved in the major league sports, particularly baseball that we're talking about. And if they're not involved as players at the high school level, at the college level, uh, not in the same numbers as men, and therefore they're not as likely to evolve into the sport professionally. Absolutely, absolutely. And it's a very, it's, a, it's an ar good argument. Uh, I have the luck of having Seal Berry, who just retired, that's announced he retired from CU, come to my class um, anytime I teach it. Um, of course, the winningest coach in, in in any sport in CU history. Um, and she asked that she, she, she's very interesting because she grew up through total, Title IX, right, in the early 70s uh, and benefited from it eventually. But she said it wasn't too long ago that there was uh, a, a law, rules and laws passed by the NCAA to make it mandatory that women didn't have to drive to games, but went to the same, played the same teams in the Pac 12 that, that the men did, that they flew to those games. Uh, that they were treated the same. It's not that long ago. And she said when she'd recruit, go into how, uh, homes to recruit in the country, and of course she was very successful, CU women's basketball in the 1990s, early 2000s was the best in the nation. She'd always have to close the deal with one of her young male assistants. Mm -hmm. Because even going, and especially in certain areas of the country, they'd still say, well, you know, New York's far from Boulder, Colorado. Is it safe? And when the man came in, they kind of cinched the deal. And she, it would frustrate her, but she knew uh, what that was like. Um, um, so there are differences. Um, I don't, again, make light of this, but I always have a quip that professional sports are the last bastion of male chauvinism uh, in the country. Uh, maybe used car sales. Uh, that was meant as the same thing. Uh, but you see that. Um, and people say, well, you know, we want to see the best. And to see the best, the most athletic, you, you see the men play. Right? But, but isn't it fair to say that a, a Seal Berry at CU, the great women golfers, the great women in, other, in tennis, for example, every, every uh, season they are building a foundation upon which their successors stand even a little taller. I mean, sure, do you absolutely. see that as a trend? Absolutely, absolutely. And she'll say this too. Gradually, you're edu it's about education, right? You're educating sports fans. What the argument is, is I'm a sports fan, male or female, I want to watch really good match. And it turns out that in soccer, for example, we watched the women, right? Last summer, not the men who stink, the women, and now they're involved in their own protest over equal pay. But it turned out soccer fans said, you know, they're pretty good. My, my wife is Spanish. Her, her father is about as male chauvinist as you can in Spain. But he was, he was watching all the games and said, you know, it's soccer. Uh, you do that in basketball, too, in the WNBA. Uh, baseball or softball, it's a different game. But certainly in basketball, too. Um, um, it, it, you know, it, it, it's a matter of being, getting used to it. Seal used to say this to me. You know, I used to lobby because... I wouldn't, I'd only get one quarter of the band at the games, the marching band, or half of the cheerleaders for the women's game. And last year, I asked a big class when I was teaching this, how many of you go to see the women's basketball? And I had four hands show up. And then a couple of boys at the back said, yeah, when they have free pizza nights, we get free pizzas, we'll go to watch the women, which are free. You got to pay for the men. Um, so is that financial? Is that Tradition? Is it sexism? What is it about sports that gives such great opportunities, though? It's such great opportunities to women and men. Uh, but there still seems to be a block there. We still seem, and maybe sports are just macho, right? And then the women who become too macho, well, then we have 
we wonder about their sexual orientation and things like that. It's, it's an interesting and probably not a solvable thing. I think what Greg is saying is absolutely right. You, you're getting, you know, gradual change. Tom, you teach and have written several books about diplomacy. Uh, diplomacy has to play some role in what you've just been talking about, the progress of women and of African-Americans, of Latino players in the different sports, not just baseball, but particularly baseball. It has to play a role in salary negotiations. It plays a big role in American society. It plays a significant role, doesn't it, in major league sports? Oh, sure. Oh, sure. Um, and, and not only, as you're saying, um, um, uh, metaphorically, uh, here, but of course, in the international side of the game too. Um, uh, you know, this this is the American, the national pastime, only because that's the tradition right now. But we're probably going to see a day, maybe not me, but see a day where where the goal is not to pitch at Yankee Stadium, but maybe to pitch somewhere in the Dominican Republic or in Tokyo. Uh, wherever. Um, um, I had a good fortune to spend a year in Japan and it's their national pastime. Sumo wrestling is no longer. Baseball is. So, and, and that came, as Greg just said, with a lot of diplomacy, with a lot of negotiation, especially sensitivity to other countries' teams because of, or, and, and leagues because those countries didn't want to lose their best players to the United States, especially the Japanese. Um, and so there were all sorts of rules in, in place there too. Um, what it has also done is uh, acculturate Americans uh, to foreign players, uh, not only bring, um, you know, uh, immigrants you know, or former immigrants or, you know, new Americans to the games like, um, like Latinos and, and others and, and Asian Americans, um, but it's also taught Americans that, you know what? Ichiro Suzuki really for that for those several years was the best hitter on the planet, maybe in history, but certainly on the planet at that time. And, you know, the fact that he's Japanese doesn't really matter to me. Um, it's, so it became, and, and baseball and the NBA especially have marketed that, um, you know, a sort of a part of diplomatic, but part of a global, um, the global arena. Uh, and, had, and again, baseball has served as sort of the, the diplomatic agent to introduce a lot of Americans uh, to, to uh, uh, foreigners or, or to the world, where they, you know, we're, you know, we're a pretty self-sufficient, insulated country, uh, too, and so we don't get that opportunity. And yet we do still call our baseball tourney, with the exception of what, one team now in Canada, the World Series. Well, the reason behind that, Greg, is it was first sponsored by the New York World newspaper oh um we of course as americans because we're americans uh we think of that as it is the world series and of course it was it is the high point it is the best baseball right but that really was uh you know that was in our race with the pulitzer newspapers and others back then uh, at the turn of the century uh but that is another part of perhaps the international side of things is the United States has used baseball as a, and sports, but certainly as a carrier of its diplomacy overseas, even of patriotism. There is no, there is no surprise that most of us still at Coors Field, before you sing, take me out to the ball game, we sing America the Beautiful, and we welcome service people, military, and honor them, and people take their hats off. Um, we play the national anthem, which was created around 1918, um, but was played in the early 1930s for the first time at games, and people stood for it uh, in the Great Depression. And it sort of was a morale booster. So patriotism in that part of foreign policy, and patriotism has always had a, a big role too uh, in this sport. Tom, I'm going to ask Claire to come in with your permission because uh, she's been looking at the questions that the audience has been virtually submitting, if that's the right word. We're all on a learning curve here. And uh, let us know what questions you've got, Claire. Well, first of all, I'd like to let you know that we have a very diverse crowd tonight. We have Detroit Tigers fans, we have Kansas City Royal fans, New York Mets fans, Boston Red Sox fans, Detroit Tigers fans, and Several Minnesota Twins fans are joining us tonight. So this is actually going back to something you were discussing earlier that I wanted to share with you. And I want to apologize to our audience. The Q&A is not allowing me to see who asked the question. So I'm not able to give attribution. But 
This is a comment. Uh, Monty Irvin, who was supposed to be one of the first to break the color barrier, but could not get out of his Negro League contract, told me that by playing with and against whites in the army, he felt that it led to acceptance of Robinson's feet. And then he also mentions that Robinson played professionally in the minors for Montreal before playing for the Dodgers. So I just, uh, I throw that comment out there for you, Tom. I'm not sure if you wanted to comment it, on that. Just very briefly, it's an excellent point. Monty Irvin was one of the greats and, and, and it was pretty typical. World War II in many ways is a transformative event for the world uh, and certainly the United States and for race relations. That's where the Robinson experiment really took off. Um, Robinson himself, of course, was an athlete and, and was, was in uh, the military um, and got honorably discharged after having a run-in on a base in, I think it was Texas, um, uh, when he wouldn't go to the back of the bus. Um, and he was brought up uh, court-martialed and eventually with some politics was uh, di um, honorably discharged. But sir, it's a great point. And World, World War II um, was the catalyst. Might also add, it was also the catalyst to the end when Monty Irvin and others to the Negro League, sorry to use that term, but that's the term was used from the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. It meant the end, uh, you know, some, some lamented that because African Americans were allowed to own their own teams and manage their own teams. They weren't allowed that in the white baseball world. And when that went out of, out of a business because of integration, that was the ultimate goal. Everybody was happy about integration, but it also meant that black business and opportunities took a major hit. The first black manager in the major leagues, anybody know that, when that was? Uh, um, nine, I think it was uh, Frank Robinson, no, no relation to Jackie Robinson in 1975. Hmm. That's almost 30 years after Jackie Robinson integrates baseball. Someone else wanted to mention that Magic Johnson is one of the owners of the Dodgers. Yep. And Another person wanted to mention that historically women made up about 40% of the attendance at baseball games. Oh, for sure. For, and, and, and sorry, and I thank you about the Magic Johnson. I don't know if he's the sole owner. I mean, I always make the allusion to the Jacksonville Jaguar uh, guy too. And that, and that has always changed. It's always moved too. Uh, but yes, I know that um, um, about Magic Johnson. Um, sure. Uh, we're, we're, seeing the tr we're seeing the shift in fans in pro football especially. You know, now they're saying that 50% of the fans, certainly at the Super Bowl or more, are women. And that's why these sports over the years, you know, 10, 15 years, 20, have started shifting to stories, stories about players, stories about cities, um, you know, uh, because the audience is, more in, is just as interested in that as, as the game itself. And we're finding that women, of course, are as knowledgeable about football or baseball than and basketball than, than men are. Uh, but that's a shift too. Um, and we'll see what happens after the influence of, of girls playing soccer. We're starting to see that now. Uh, there are women playing soccer, how that's changed things too, and fandom. But Tom, as a reflection of American society in soccer, there is a pay gap between what the men, the professional men earn, and what the professional women earn. In baseball, we can't talk about female players, but we can talk about minority players, African-Americans, Latinos. Is there any pay gap? Is there, it's not something I've ever studied, but I have the impression that it is strictly merit-based and agent-based, but that, you know, if other things being equal, uh, the best white player doesn't earn a dollar more than the best African-American player. Am I, I right or wrong? Yeah, and I'm, I'm not fully knowledgeable about that, but I think you're, out, you're right. I, I, that, that's right. Um, there might be a little lag the way players come into the league. If they're coming from overseas, especially from Latin America, they're coming in at a lower pay. Um, you know, what's the minimum now? $600,000 for a major league contract. So it's not bad. Um, a lot less than history professors make, but you know, I feel sorry. For you. Um, um, but yeah, I think it, it's, it's all up front now. And that's probably less a credit to the waning of racism or integration than it is to free agency that really came in and, and really was the, a, transform, a transformation in 1975, 76. We didn't see the salaries really skyrocket till the early 90s. And now, of course, they're just off out the charts. Um, but that's probably where that all came in. They realized 
players were playing for the love of the game, but there was also a business for them and that they could, you know, team with these owners and everybody could make money. Um, so stratospheric uh, that it could take race or, you know, those issues out of the picture. And so stratospheric that, you know, if you've got baseball talent folks out there or sports talent, don't go to medical school or law school. You're going to make so much more uh, than any of those lowly professions, lowly professions as bankers or doctors or, again, history professors a lot more, but that's a, another issue. I think Claire has uh, more questions sure. from the, the people who are watching. Okay, I'm back. So one of the questions I had also was that the United States gets a lot of guff, I think, for having American sports, whereas you know the rest of the world tends to share soccer as kind of the world sport, that we have baseball and in particular American football that aren't really shared by the rest of the world or very many countries outside the United States. But I'm so glad you mentioned sumo earlier because I think sumo is cool and I'm glad it's a Japanese sport and that they have this sort of uh, historic sport. Why can't we have sports that are largely just American? Yeah, well, we do. We, we, I mean, we have not only these two sports of football um, that, you know, is sort of a, you know, brand of rugby. We also had this big debate over baseball I mentioned as its origins. Birdie basically knew it came from rounders, which was a children's game in England, um, and cricket. It actually comes, now the research shows that it comes from an 18th century game that was called baseball in England, and then sort of died out in England. But they had base, a game called baseball. Um, but baseball, we have to admit it, I love it. It's bizarre. It is a weird game. I mean, the defense has the ball, first of all, unlike other sports. You, you bring a player from the 19th century to a game, and he might be uh, uh, wowed by the lights, which took a long time anyway for that to, to, to be accepted, a uh, night baseball. He might be wowed, but he'd understand the game. He'd understand the field. He'd certainly understand what they're wearing. What are these guys wearing? Knickers? I mean, who wears that kind of thing anymore? So this is a throwback. Major League Baseball has marketed that. Uh, in the 70s and 80s, when football was really taking off and baseball was really suffering, baseball was doing disco nights. And all this, and they realized, well, we're going to get these new stadiums and we're going to get these foreign players. Those were the two catalysts to baseball being saved in the 90s. Coors Fields, all these new stadiums, and the uh, foreign players. But they also made a strategic uh, decision to say, let's look backward. This is a game about nostalgia. It's America. And what they found, Claire, was people who had gone to the games, the baby boomers, who had now were retiring, 50s, 40s, 50s, 60s now, and had gone with their parents. Now we're taking their kids to these games. And they would take them to a place called not Coors Astrodome, but Coors Field and Parks and Camden Yards. Those are all 19th century, early 20th century term, terms that baseball made a concerted effort to say, we can't compete with football. Football's always looking forward. Has all the cameras all over the field and instant replay. We're going to look backward. And that's nostalgia. And we're going to look backward to when people remembered or thought America was great, right? After post-World War II. And it worked for baseball. Well, I'm wondering if it will still work for baseball. We hosted... Uh, marketing and innovation expert Rohit Bhargava just a few weeks ago, and he talks about megatrends. And one of those megatrends that he's seen accelerated right now during the pan time of the pandemic is what he calls revivalism or nostalgia. So mm. perhaps this whole situation might wind up being a boon to American baseball. Oh, sure. Sure. I could see it happening. I, again, I think the real boom will be the globalization of the game or the continued globalization of the game, but certainly, certainly um, you can sell nostalgia. You can sell that and um, you can understand baseball. You can get kids involved. It's a game that if a kid might not play football and you know parents are now kind of shying away and from football, a lot of them, they can play baseball um, and, and, and softball. Um, so yes, it's, it, I think it is, again, it is a, in part marketing, but part um, uh, a trend. 
um, to, to look back to simpler times. Listen, Donald Trump also was not the first one to come up with a campaign slogan, make America great again, right? He, he actually ripped that directly in 1980 from Ronald Reagan. Go Google that. Too. That was Ronald Reagan's campaign to make America great again. Um, and before that, there were, there were plays on that too. Baseball, we say mom and apple pie also, right? All those quintessential American things. And we sing, take me out to the ball game that you all knew. But baseball was one of those sort of foundations, one of those, those touchstones, right? Even Ken Burns made a lot of that in his, in his great documentary. It was a, it gave you a sense of home, right? A sense of familiarity. And it was American. It was American. You got it. You got it. I've never heard anybody sing, take me out to the ball game at a soccer match. No, no, that's true. So well, right from last year, ahead, oh, I'm sorry, Greg, go ahead. Okay. The great American pastime, you said right at the beginning of your talk that it's not really anymore baseball because football has stolen its thunder, but now you seem to be cover, coming full circle to saying baseball is trying to get that back and maybe it will succeed. Do I read you right? Uh, I don't, I, no, let me, let me be realistic. I don't think baseball is going to pass football unless this, this whole thing about brain injuries and, you know, really in the next 30 years has, as an impact and it might, and it might. And, and if, uh, and if politics and kneeling, the kneeling thing, if that really undermines things, uh, too. Um, but I don't see it. One of the reasons is the cost. You, you can play football at the highest level for free in high school. Baseball, you can play in high school, but we know now it's really the summer leagues. And a lot of that you have to pay for, right? You got to pay for that too. Uh, basketball to an extent too, though basketball, really you can play at the highest level in, in high school too. So, so uh, football and basketball will be a ticket for underrepresented or poor kids or middle class kids uh, um, for a long time. Um, it also baseball suffers because, you know, my my love of baseball, it's my personal opinion. I when the Rockies come out on the field on that green field and white uniforms, to me that's the highlight of the game. When they come out, I think it's beautiful. And there are times and I'm not even looking at the batter or the action. You're looking at the fielders. Well, you know, you hear around you, this is boring. You know, it's a boring game. Why can't they have more runs? They tried. The game has changed a, a lot. You know, Babe Ruth changed it. But, of course, we like home runs. But really, if you're a true baseball fan, you like the two-to-one the two, the two to one score and a, and a pitcher's goal. It's a defensive game. That doesn't seem in keeping with uh, what America's um, – younger Americans' um, uh, love of sports is all about, too. And – we're in a saturated sports market. I mean, how, I don't know how many teams Denver has. I don't, I don't know what indoor rugby, outdoor rugby, lacrosse, all this other stuff um, is competing with it too. The hope, certainly I think for um, um, women will be soccer uh, too, as a more Americans like that. Uh, I think baseball will maintain, will be strong. But I gotta, I gotta see when the baby boomers are gone, you know, 30, 40 years out. Um, whether the shift will be more to an international style of baseball where you'd have a true world series between a U.S. winner and Japan, a Japanese winner. You know, we have so that. Maybe, maybe as long as there are Americans and maybe they're young Americans today, but they, they morph into people like me, Americans who would rather go to a ma and pa shop than shop in a big box store. Americans who, would prefer to stop at a small independent roadside diner for a hamburger than to go to a nationwide chain. Maybe for those people at least, baseball, because of its qualities, the ones you've, you've articulated, will remain as the great American pastime. I think I think could be right in small town America, although the demographics in America themselves are changing, more urban uh, areas, obviously. Uh, but I think there's something to that. And there's nothing like the accessibility of going to a minor league game. Um, I don't think you get that in other sports. College football, maybe, but even that's become big business. And that's the key, too. I, you just mentioned the big box um, uh, uh, analogy, which I think holds, because they, this sport has got to think of a way to open up and make itself more accessible. Maybe it, it's simply of having players come along the dugout and, and sign autographs. But most of them aren't even allowed to do that. 
uh, by agents and maybe kind of, we know the money is there, but sort of take that money out of it and make it more accessible. I used to take my kids down to the Sky Sox in Colorado Springs. You know, you, you know you, after the game, a player would throw you the ball. They'd walk through the stands to the showers. Um, you need probably in all of our sports more of that too. Um, because baseball players have this going for them. They look like Americans. I, I know a lot of them are buff and they're big and everything else. It's hard for me to relate to a basketball player on CU Boulder's campus, a kid who's 20 years old, who's you know, eight feet tall, or a football player whose legs, one leg is twice my size. Um, baseball players though, you know, you can get away with in baseball, they're, they're, most of them are in shape, but it's really a high hand eye coordination sport. And that means that, you know, Michael Jordan turned out not to be a very good baseball player, but he's a fabulous athlete. And I think Americans can relate to that. That's probably what baseball needs to do in the future and, and, and really cultivate that sort of homegrown, down to earth image. Well, Tom and Greg, thank you guys both so much. We're at the seven o'clock hour. I do wanna share one comment that one of our attendees mentioned. Uh, they said baseball attendance is so much more than football or basketball at more than 100 million people between the minors and majors. So they play every day, not just once a week. So uh, they're definitely strong fans and certainly people who are rooting for this sport to survive and thrive. For sure. And let me just add very quickly, because I know we're, we're on a time uh, crunch here. Um, Major League Baseball will tell you attendance is their fourth revenue gainer, though. They like fans in the, in the stadium, but they like you to download and stream and buy their, buy their $200 T-shirts or whatever they are. That's where they're making their money on it, too. But certainly fans go and tradition, it's a tradition. You know, you go on Memorial Day, you go on July 4th, see the fireworks. It's baseball. So sure, um, the, fans, the fans are substantial. Thank you so much, Greg, you. you as well. And thank all of you for joining us this evening. And I hope we'll see you next week for our program with the two governors again on Thursday evening, June 4th at 6 p.m. Thanks so much, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.